thank you for coming and, and welcome. Welcome all of you uh, on this uh, beautiful uh, fall morning. It's crisp and beautiful. And, uh, and again, we thank you for coming and worshiping with us. Uh, Pastor Eric is uh, continuing through his, uh, his series on uh, renewal, recalibration, re... I forgot, sorry. But, <laughs> uh, but, it's, but it's mostly about realigning. It's mostly about realigning our own hearts, our own ideas of what are right and wrong or, or, or what God wants us to do with, with the true north, with... Uh, with uh, the Bible and, uh, and and His Word, and it's just really I'm 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 really enjoying this series. Thank you so much. Um, there are some announcements in, in our in our newsletter rooted together that you that you can uh, that are out that are out there. The most important one is uh, is that a week from today we will be uh, having a special um, meeting, a special congregational meeting. Uh, to vote on, um, uh, on uh, to approve um, what's called a vicinage council. It's kind of a big word. Um, a week, um, not a week, at our last elders meeting, the elders um, uh, voted unanimously to, to convene uh, or to invite local pastors to um, examine Pastor Eric. That's called a vicinage council. Uh, council. It is the next step in his full ordination in the four C's, which is our, uh, well, anyway. So the, the, the four C's, congregational uh, church, two more C's in there. Um, anyway, um, I've known Eric, it's been my privilege to know uh, and uh, Eric for 14 years. And, uh, and I'm sure that most of you also know him as a great man of God and, and uh, uh, pastor. And this is the next step in his, in his journey to be, uh, uh, to be uh, fully ordained um, in, uh, in, in uh, this uh, great organization. So please, if you can, uh, right after next, ser- uh, next week's uh, uh, service, there'll be this, um, this uh, meeting. And uh, thank you very much. That's all I got. Let's stand together for our call to worship, taken from Psalm 116. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me? I will lift up the cup of salvation and call on the name of the Lord. I will fulfill the promises I made to him here as a witness to all his people. In the courts of the house of the Lord, in your midst, O Jerusalem, praise the Lord.
Jesus this morning because of the great wonder of what you have done for us in being willing to lay down your own life to cleanse us from our sins. We pray that as a church that we would come together, that we would stand in the light, and that we would never stop proclaiming your salvation, proclaiming your great love and the glory of who you are. Please be with us for the rest of this service. Bless the reading of your word. And the words that you've given to Pastor Eric, give us quickened hearts and eyes and ears and minds to take in what you have for us. Amen. Please greet one another with the love of Christ. start to our service, reminding ourselves of the reality of a risen, risen Christ and what that means. You know, I remember hearing that first, uh, that line, oh, death, where is there a sting? I remember listening. For some of you, this may mean something. To you young ones, you'll have no clue what I'm talking about, but there was a band in the day called the Resurrection Band, and one of their community members actually died, and they wrote this song kind of clinging to this verse. 
reminding themselves of this truth that, oh, death, where is your sting? Because of the reality that we have a risen Christ and Lord and Savior. If you ever want to listen, I'm sure you can find it on YouTube somewhere, but it's old school. <laughs> and to quote the Incredibles, which I'm a fan of, there's no school like the old school. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, well, let's quiet our hearts before the Lord in prayer. Father, we, we come to you. We are so grateful that you have given us hope because of the reality of the resurrection. And we cling to that truth. We cling to that truth because of what you have done. You've given us hope. You've given us hope when all the world seems to be going haywire. You've given us hope when we struggle to make sense of life as we are in the midst of pain and some experiencing the shadow of death and grieving the loss of loved ones, others struggling with illnesses and, and just physical ailments. That, that we cling to you, Father. We come and we cling to you. We pray that you would heal our spirits. We pray that you would heal our minds. Help us to know our significance is in you and you alone. In the pit of despair, we pray that we cry out to you, our God, our living God, and remind ourselves that you are promised to be with us. So we pray in the darkness of despair that we would sense your presence. In the darkness of sorrow, we would sense your presence. In the midst of pure joy and exuberance, we would sense your presence. In all that we do, we pray that we do it as if doing it unto you, Lord Jesus. You ask for our hearts. Lord, we lift them up to you. We lift them up to you and pray that you'd mold us and shape us into the people you'd have us to be. People who live in the grip of your kingdom. People who so are and so in love with you, we can't contain it. We do pray for our loved ones who don't know you. Lord, that you would bring people into their lives when they turn around, that circumstances would just lead them to meeting people who know you and will point to you, who will lift you up and make you known. And again, as we reflect on that prayer, remind us that perhaps we are the answer to somebody else's prayer. So help us to come alongside people who need to hear about your goodness and who you are. Give us a vision of what you're doing in our midst and help us to come alongside that, Lord, giving you glory and praise and honor. Father, we need you. We need you to make us into your son's likeness. Lord, how we long to be more like him. And so here we are. Earthen vessels, common pots. But Lord, you've told us in your word that in us is this immeasurable treasure. It's yourself. So we are so thankful that you have given us yourself. So Lord, as we navigate life, as we lift up those who are dealing with physical ailments and struggles, we pray that you give us hearts that are quick to come alongside, quick to encourage, quick to empathize, quick to walk with those folk. Be with us now as we pray the prayer that you taught us, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. 
things I forgot to mention and before we went to prayer. Uh, I did uh, reach out last Sunday um, before the service. Andy Trailer reached out to me and said, hey, by the way, uh, I don't know if you heard that um, Larry McLaughlin was going in for a brain uh, uh, surgery on Monday. So I did call him and I actually called Mary Ellen and she says, well, he's right here. And so I did talk to him, and he's very lucid. The tumor was removed, and he was up and motoring around. And when he was given the choice of oxycodone or morphine, he said, how about Tylenol? So he was really doing well. Uh, there's still some, you know, hurdles in terms of analyzing the tumor. What is it? And so it was, I think it was pretty quick. It manifests itself in just a lack of mobility, but he's doing well. But keep them in their, your prayers as well. As we continue to worship the Lord in our giving, uh, this passage is actually a little after the passage that will be read a little later on. It's a well-known passage. It says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. So as we give, know that the Lord has a plan for us here at Trinity Church. And it's a hope and a future. And I pray that we would just really be bold enough to participate what God is doing in that. So let's prepare our hearts for giving. Just in case I mumble too much while I sing, we're going to project the words for you up there. Um, feel free to sing along in the chorus if you pick it up. Server, you remind us of our Savior's bowl and towel. Teacher, you are raising up a child to be kind. Lawyer, give us hope that justice one day will surround us. May God's kingdom come on earth his will be done.
technology. This is all part of your wonderful creation for which we greatly thank you. With this offering we return to you just some of what you have given to us. And we pray that this is used wisely for the support of this church here in Bolton, for the surrounding community and your ministry around the world. As we pray in your name. Amen. 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 Children, are you, you're dismissed for kinder time and children's time. passage comes from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verses 4 through 7, and that is in page 1221 of the Pew Bible, and starting at verse 4. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. And our New Testament reading comes from 1 Peter, chapter 2, verses 1 through 12, and that's on page 1888 of your pew Bible. 1 Peter, chapter 2, 1 through 12, starting at verse 1. Therefore, rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, and offerings, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone and a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. 
but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. All right. And uh, the gospel reading for today comes from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, on page 1501 in your pew Bibles. Matthew 5, 13 through 16. All right, starting at verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men, that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his holy and inspired word. It was really great to see Anthony walk through the door, given what they've been going through of late. I wasn't sure he would be here. His wife, you know, so you probably saw the email if you're in the church, but his wife is, pre is pregnant, and the water potentially broke, but then it did, you know, so she's not fully broken, but she's here, and we're so grateful that God is working in a very quick way, uh, but it was so great to see them here with us, because I was coming up with plan B really quickly, and which included my wife, because she's my wife and was willing to step up, and so. Uh, let's pray. Father, we come before you, and we we pray that you would have your way with our hearts. It's your name we pray. Amen. If you've been with us, you know we're in this series called Re, as Steve was trying to communicate, and he's not feeling well. He's dealing with a sickness himself, so he's gone home. But, but it's capturing this idea of needing to recommit, renew, rethink, reevaluate, reassess, uh, and that we think deeply about God's will and our need, our need to align ourselves or perhaps even realign ourselves to his purposes and plan to take stock of what's really important. And one of the principles that's been the backdrop of this series is called magnetic declination. For those who are wilderness travelers, you know that there's a difference between magnetic north, which the compasses points to, and true north, which the maps are oriented to. And, you know, if we're honest, we are drawn to and attracted to many things, often good things, but we have to ask, are they God's best for us? So it's important to take stock and ask, am I aligned to true north, God's desire for me, or am I pursuing my own agenda? Am I following what I'm attracted to? Another declination, declination type question is to ask is, what's shaping my faith? Or is my worldview shaping my faith? Or is my faith shaping my worldview? That may seem like a, a subtle difference, but it makes all the difference in the world. Again, when you have magnetic declination, if you're traveling 100 feet, well, the difference between magnetic and north and true north may be very slight. You may not be off that far. But the further down the road you go, if you're traveling 100 miles, well, that difference could put you 10 miles off course or even further. So it's really important to consider 
this idea of declination and consider, you know, am I in my own faith? And what is real? Am I really pointed to a true north? So as we have been going through this series, the other part is we need to see that each week is not a separate topic. Uh, if I was going to give you an analogy, it'd be an analogy of rope, and each topic is like a strand of a rope, and they're intertwined. You cannot pull them apart. They're intertwined and need to be intertwined, and it's really intertwined to make our faith stronger. So the first Sunday, we looked at the importance of corporate gatherings. How do we love each other as brothers and sisters of the Lord, and how can we encourage each other? It is so important for us to gather each Sunday, not only to worship God, but to come together in corporate worship and to remind ourselves of what's really important. It's that strand we cannot really do away with, nor can we do away with probably the most important strand of loving the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And so, you know, we've been looking at, you know, when Jesus asked the question to Peter, do you love me more than these? And I know some of you have been writing down what your these are. What are the things that I may be putting before my God? And these are important things, but those two strands are really important. How do I love the Lord my God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength? And how do I love the fellow believers in a way that's tangible? And the third part of that, which we're going to deal with today, is then, well, what does that mean for how do I interact with the rest of society? How does that, what does that mean for the way I kind of uh, interact with the world? As we know, idolatry, which was the last week we talked about the these is, is, is really a temptation. We make an idols of so many things. And so a faithful Jew would hold up Deuteronomy 6, I need to love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, and strength. And they would, they would hold that up daily, morning and night, just to remind themselves, this is where my heart needs to be. And we need to do the same as Christ, as we, with Christ, and as we have this ongoing struggle. But one of the issues in this ongoing struggle of not putting God first is sometimes we forget what it is that God had intended for us anyways. What is, what is the purpose for our lives? Uh, when we look at First Peter, again, the text in, in chapter 2, if you see in verses 4 and 8, it's really kind of a great synopsis of where we've been the last two weeks. The first part talks about the centrality and preeminence of Christ. He is the cornerstone, the living stone upon which we build our entire lives, on which the entire church is built upon. He is the cornerstone. So we come to him, the living stone, as an individual loving him first and foremost. Then we too, like living stones are being built into a spiritual house. And so we need to be a part of this house to worship with others in order to fulfill God's purpose for our lives. But Peter does something else in this first part of this chapter. He quite clearly has tied our role of believers, as believers in Christ, to something that Moses says earlier uh, in Scripture. That Well, actually, God says through Moses in Scripture in and so in Exodus 19, verses 3 through 6, you see this idea that the, Moses goes up to God, and Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, this is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt, how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then Out of all the nations, you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. But note the language. So Israel was to be set apart, chosen, unique, to represent God to the nations, fulfilling this covenantal promise as given to Abraham. You will be a blessing. Uh, All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So this is a covenantal promise given to Abraham that Moses picks up on and says you are to be a nation of priests. But Peter uses the same language, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. While the wording is not the same as the Great Commission as found in Matthew, it still has that same thrust, clearly calling us to present God to the world. We have a role, a purpose. 
Now, I remember when those of us who are sharing our experiences with you all after a service about our experiences with Voice of Calvary, Len Baird was wrestling with a concept, an idea, and he was beginning to flesh it out. Uh, and he, as he shared, he said, he, uh, and I believe he sh shared it like this, he says, I'm, I've been, I've, I'm beginning to understand that it's not only what I'm saved from, but it's what I'm saved for that's important. It's not that we're just saved from hell, but we're saved for a purpose, and that purpose is to be a holy priesthood representing God to the nations. God has redeemed us. So Peter is saying we're saved for this purpose. We are royal priesthood, and one of our roles as priests is to point people to the living God. Now Peter points out that we're God's special possessions that we may declare the praises of him who called you, called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. We're to declare the praises of that. Now, the danger for any church, for any believer for that matter, is to hide behind our own walls, ignoring the calling of God and become unengaged with the communities around us. Not my job. I'm not an evangelist. But let's remind ourselves of the titles that Peter lists. Chosen, royal, priesthood, holy. Doesn't that give you pause? Doesn't that cause you to kind of catch your breath that this is a way that when we're in Christ, this is our new standing? This is how God sees us because of what Christ has done? I mean, Paul uses similar language in Romans 8 calls us co-heirs with Christ. So when I greet my young friends and when sometimes when I'm doing life in the church, I'll greet you and I'll say, good morning, princes and princes of the king. It's because that's the language that is used that when we're in Christ, that's how we're viewed by our heavenly father. We're royalty. And so these titles should mean something to us. And in Colossians, Paul uses something similar. He calls us chosen and dearly loved. Therefore, it's God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved. And I think we need to wrap our minds around how God views us in Christ Jesus when we fully yielded ourselves. But we also need to understand that there's this work of reconciliation. He's reconciled us to himself, but God in his wisdom involves us in this message of redemption. So Paul gives us another title. He calls us ambassador. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gives us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against him. He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we're God's ambassadors, although, as though he was making his appeal through us. These titles that are bestowed on us are, are only because of what Christ has done. It's because of God's mercy. It's only when we come to him, the living stone, as the ones who trust him, and we'll never be put to shame. Doesn't that give you great hope? Doesn't that just overwhelm you, this truth that in Christ you'll never be put to shame? with Peter's recounting of who we are in Christ and the role we are to play, he touches on another intriguing concept that I want us to, to think deeply on. It's this understanding that we are exiles, resident aliens, if you will, foreigners. You know, when I was preaching the first service, um, Ann Feely came up to me after the service. I got my resident alien card. Being from Norway, she's a resident alien, even though she's been here for like 30-something years. But she had her card. She says, I'm a resident alien, but I'm also a resident alien since I was four years old when I yielded my life to Christ. We are resident aliens. And the language is such that it draws our attention to the passage in, in Jeremiah. But it also captures much of Israel, Israel's history from the patriarchs, who were resident aliens almost everywhere they went, to the exodus, and even the moment of exile. 
So Jeremiah in this section, and I read it earlier for the offering in this passage where you know, you know this passage, I know the plans I have for you, but he encourages just prior to that with 70 years of exile, you're going to be in this situation for 70 years. He says, hunker down. Not only hunker down, but seek to contribute and help this place in which you're living. Make a difference. Impact the communities in which you're living. Hunker down. So Peter, and in similar language to Jeremiah, asks his readers not to live in the same way as the culture they find themselves, but to live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he, in the day he visits, on the day he visits. Again, as we look to the, it's in context, we are to take on the role of priests representing God to the nations. And one of the significant ways we can do this is by how we live. That we live in such a way as to benefit the community in which we're living to glorify God. Now, in the gospel reading, the hearer of Jesus was asked to consider what it means to be salt of the earth. Salt that was preserves things from rotting, going bad. Mary White reminded me it also gives flavor, and it does. So we are to be salt of the earth, preserve, keep from rotting, bring flavor. But if we check out and throw our hands up and say, this, this world is too crazy, and merely cloister within these walls each Sunday, then are we truly being salt of the earth? Now, I get it that it's hard to persevere in doing good. I understand that. I understand that it can be hard. Paul encourages the uh, Galatians not to grow weary in doing good. It can be hard and the world really doesn't want anything to do with the things of God. You know, I bet many of the early believers could have said the same thing. Yet the call still stands. You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. Now, if we are the light of the world, then we're called to let that light shine. Why? Again, note the similarity between what Jesus said and how Peter understands it and what he writes in his letter. Uh, Peter says, we should live such good lives among pagans that they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. But hear how Jesus says it. Let your light shine that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. It's not about bringing us past in the back. It's all about bringing glory to God. It's about having a testimony that's lived out loud. So Peter clearly has a Sermon on the Mountain view when he writes this portion of the letter. He clearly sees that in response to Christ, this is how we should live. Such good lives. He clearly sees this as a call to obedience, obedience steeped in our love for Jesus. If you look at the Sermon on the Mount in Luke, in chapter 6, right after that, Luke 6, 46, I think it is, Jesus says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? He's calling them, and that, that follows the Sermon on the Mount. There's this expectation that this is how we should live. We should live in such a way that's so, such an antithesis to the culture around us. It's me first. And here, the God of the universe who steps into our world says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and are not doing what I'm teaching you, not doing what I'm living out what I'm saying? In obedience, steeped in our love for Jesus, Peter calls us to live such good lives. So our roles and titles that Peter lists are in response to what God has done. And we must not, we must not lose sight of the truth that we live such good lives in response to God's mercy. 
not as a way in an attempt to earn God's favor and make him indebted to us for some twisted reason. I think sometimes we do that. God, I did this for you. Come on. We don't know. It's in response to what God has done. And we need to think deeply about this and align ourselves do a spiritual declination and align ourselves to who God is and who he's calling us to be for his glory and his name's sake. So we need to think deeply about our role as royal priests in the context of the school. You are a royal priest when you walk through the schools. It's probably not a thought you're thinking about. You're a royal priest in, in, when you go to work, when you're in the grocery store, wherever you are, you cannot shed this title. This is who you are. This is who we are. We need to think deeply. Are we pointing people to Christ by allowing his love to flow through us? Are we pointing people to Christ? We need to think deeply and give careful thought about how we live in our neighborhoods. Are we consistently living in such a way that we're drawing people and pointing people to Christ for his glory? Maybe a couple of you would live in the same neighborhood. Say, hey, you know what? Let's get together and pray. Let's, get, let's catch a vision. What does God want to do? What is he doing? How can we pray for our neighborhoods? We need to think deeply and give careful thought about what it means that we are resident aliens and our true citizenship is in the kingdom of God. Again, it's not how is my worldview shaping my faith, but it's how my faith is shaping my worldview. How is the God of Scripture shaping who I am? We are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. Now, this last truth, we are resident aliens, we are citizens of heaven. This is not a license to check out. Again, it's not what we're saved from, but more importantly, what are we saved for? No, we're not to check out. We are to re-engage. We are to engage the people around us right where God is planting us, invest in our communities, be they family, work, school, sports team, dance, whatever. You are a royal priest, holy. Maybe it's bringing a meal to a neighbor and letting them know you're praying for them. Maybe it's a conversation in a soccer, the sideline of a sports game that leads to a lunch, that leads to a conversation about faith. Maybe it's picking up books that a classmate or even a freshman, oh my goodness, dropped or sitting with a student struggling to connect during lunch. Maybe it's encouraging somebody with a new dance move. It's loving people because God so loved us. I, you know, Walter, I'm reminded when you preached, to, I don't even remember how long ago, but you were sharing that story of going to Lowe's and at the checkout counter, it led to a conversation and you had some electrical stuff and the woman says, do you know anything about this stuff? A little bit. And she invites you home to do a home project. You go home and meet the man who is struggling. His health is bad and ends up praying with him. See, Walter was being yielded to the nudging of the Holy Spirit, living in such a way that allowed him to do good, which opened the door to share the gospel. We are a royal priesthood. Now note that Peter didn't say some of you are a royal priesthood. Moses didn't say some of you are priests. No, we are a nation of priests. You are a royal priesthood. Now it's true that some of us have a calling to stand before you and proclaim and try to encourage you to be all that God intends for you, for us to be. But for the Israelites, you are a nation of priests. That's what they were supposed to be. But they lost sight of that. So Peter, in Christ Jesus, recaptures what they were meant to be. And in Christ Jesus, the true Israelite, you are a royal priesthood that is who we are 
you cannot defer that responsibility onto somebody else. This is who you are. You are to be salt. You are to be light, as I am. One day I saw a friend share this quote on uh, Facebook. It's attributed to Bonhoeffer. Jim, if you could put that up so I can better read it. Uh, I was trying to do it in the first service, but we didn't have the video screen, and the font so small down here I couldn't read it. But your life as a Christian should make the non-believer question their disbelief in God. Your life as a Christian should question their non-belief in God. So Peter in his letter is saying the very thing. As resident aliens, we live in such a way as to bring God glory, that they would see our good works and glorify God to point to the reality of God. There's a clear challenge to us to be in the world but not of it. But until Christ returns, we are to be its ambassadors. We are to be its royal priests, living in such a way to bring glory to God, living in such a way that we can earn the opportunity to speak into somebody's lives and share the hope we have in Christ. Now, some of you are bolder in the speaking department and others are more active in living in out department. But the two need to be intertwined. We cannot and must not separate the two. You who are bold to speak, be quick to live it out in love. For those who are quick to do good deeds, be ready and willing to speak to your hope you have in Christ. In other words, we need to walk the talk, but we also need to talk the walk. We need to view our entire lives as an integral way God wants us to live. Do you get that? We need to live our lives as in our entire lives as an integral way God wants us to live. If we don't understand that we are to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, strength everywhere, we may find ourselves. We reduce Christianity from full time, this is who I am, into a hobby. We we so often squeeze God into our agenda throughout the week instead of living fully in his plan. We, we so need to avoid the flipping the switch on Sunday and then neglect to make the connections of how our faith impacts the way we conduct ourselves the rest of the week. This is where we need to do the spiritual declination. Am I living consistently in my faith? Is my faith determining my way I think, my worldview? Is my faith really challenging and changing the way I see things? The world needs you and me. It needs us. You are the salt of the earth. Jesus didn't ask the hearer if they wanted to be. He just said, you are. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. I mean, here the hearer is given a choice. Hide the light or let it shine. But it doesn't seem like much of a choice with light. No, you put a light on the stand so everyone in the room benefits, not just those you like. Everyone in the room benefits from the light. You are called to be the light of the world. Nation, Israel was called to be a nation of priests. We in Christ are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. As we conclude thinking deeply upon who we are in Christ, let us not forget whose we are in Christ. We are gods. And let us think deeply about how best to respond to God's mercy in Christ. And one response needs to be a re-engagement, a recommitment to our role of being a royal priesthood, a royal priest living as a resident alien in the world, in the world but not of it, in such a way as to glorify God, pointing people to his feet. We need to re-engage with our calling to be in the world but not of it, to be light and salt. We need to recommit to that. Whether they come to Trinity or not, that doesn't change our need to 
bring point people to Christ. We need to re-engage and re-see our role in our schools and our workplace. And may the God of grace strengthen us because we need his help in all of this. We have one more week as we look to what does it mean to realign ourselves. You guys can come up. It's but I pray that we would think deeply, what does it mean to live in obedience to who God is? He's called us to love each other, yes. Love each other because he loved us. Love each other out of our abundance of love for God. You cannot love God and not love each other. And nor can we love God and discount the world he has made because he has called us as a special possession to be royal priests representing to the nations, to the world, to our neighborhoods, to our families, that he is God and he alone saves. Let's pray and then we'll sing. Father, to you be glory. Lord, help us to lift you up. Give us a desire to know you and to yield ourselves fully to you. And may we see our role as royal priests planted right where we are to bring you glory and honor by what we say, but also by what we do. In your name we pray. Amen. Oh, let's read, I'm sorry, let's read one more thing, I'm sorry. Uh, in unison, before we sing, our uh, unison reading just to help us think deeply about it. it. Finally, brothers and sisters, read with me. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Thank you. Let's stand together. Thank you for the sun, thank you for the moon, thank you for the stars and night and the darkness too. Bless you for your peace, bless you for your grace, bless you for your perfect love and your perfect ways. And all shall be well, all shall be what it means to be your hands and feet. May we bring the kingdom come to everyone we meet. So give us ears that hear. Lord, give us eyes that see the reconciling of our earth with the kingdom yet to be. And all shall be well, all shall be
so appreciate our music team from Tim to Robin who leads the youth and just a sensitivity to the Holy Spirit that so often without even conversing with me the songs just seem to fit and I really appreciate that I don't know if you got that that's what I got I know they probably pray about it and um, you know one of the things when we looked at these scriptures a royal priesthood doesn't say well, wait 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 how old are you there's, are, are, you, are you a guy or a woman? None of that. You are a royal priesthood, no matter how old you are. And we need to live this out in the context of wherever God has us planted, that we might be his people pointing to the nations and to the world the reality of God entering into our midst to save us and redeem us. So hear this. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up therefore as we as uh, we have opportunity let us do good to all people especially to those who belong to the family of believers let us do good to all people may you go out and represent the king in your title as a royal priest go and serve